And there's, there's lots of examples that we see. We see it all the time, actually, where um, a, a, an employee takes an email the wrong way. They, they take yep. it as a, as a attack on them or they yes. take it as a, as a demand. They've got to do this. And then when they, when the two parties meet and discuss it, mm-hmm. It's actually fine. Yeah. Um, they actually were both on the same page in the first place. So, yes. you know, it, it's really hard to get. And we actually see clients use like things like emojis all the time as a way to, <laughs> you can actually add some emotion or some subtlety to an email, perhaps. I mean, it's never going to replace in person conversations, but no, you've but- got to be really conscious. Hello and welcome to another edition of Better Business, Better Life. Today I'm joined by Lawrence McLean, who is the Associate Director of Operations of EmployShaw here in New Zealand. And of course, EmployShaw is actually an Australian and New Zealand company. Is that right? That's right. That's correct. Welcome to the studio. Lovely to have you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Yeah. So I'm very much looking forward to talking to you because we talk about EOS as people being like the life force of the business. You know, Mm. people can make or break a business. And obviously your specialty is around ensuring that both the employer and the employee are on the same page and and, working together together. So looking forward to hearing about that. But first of all, let me just hear a little bit about your background. So how did you come to be at EmployShore? What's your background, Lawrence? What do you do? Great. Thanks, Deborah. Um, It's great to be here. Um, Look, I really come from a legal and business background. I've uh, worked in a couple of different organizations. Um, When I first started actually outside of university, I worked at Community Law Waikato and we really worked with employees with difficult situations that they were in. So looking at the employee side of the equation, for the last six years or so, I've been working at EmployShaw New Zealand, looking at the employer side of the equation. So I've I've kind of seen both sides of the equation. I've, I've seen the difficulties that can arise from an employee point of view, from an employer employer point of view mm-hmm. and also what, what works well perhaps what doesn't work well sure. and the sorts <laughs> of I think situations the sorts of processes the sorts of opportunities and ideas that, that both sides of that equation can use to have a really really successful um, employment relationship mm-hmm. and I'm sure as you and your listeners will know that a success, successful employment relationship always leads to a better business. Yes, absolutely. I completely agree. So I think that sometimes, though, people get a little bit nervous because, I mean, um, EOS is actually an American operating system. Yeah. And so I remember when we, you know, first get sort of trained in EOS, so they talk about people, they kind of go, oh, if somebody's not the right person, you need mm-hmm. to get rid of them. Yeah. It's not quite as simple as that over here. We have slightly different laws for good reason. Yeah. Um, so people get nervous when they, you know, when they know that mm-hmm. they have to actually deal with people issues, but they shouldn't be nervous, should they? No, that's right. I mean, if you have a, if you, if you start with really strong fundamentals, you maintain that through the entire employment relationship. Mm-hmm. You can nine times out of ten have a really successful employment relationship. And as you spoke about, it's not quite the same as the fire at will system in America. We we yeah. do have more obligations here. And, and in fact, New Zealand does have a fairly complex and sometimes grey employment employment space. But you know, having really strong processes, having that support planning for those sorts of situations that you might come across can can make your life a whole lot easier both as a business owner and as a member working within a business as well so you know if you, if you come with that sort of approach you come with that sort of planned approach then then it's all it's all surmountable fair enough and so you know in some of the businesses that are growing very very fast mm. things change quite rapidly yeah. um, how do you kind of make sure that you are um, keeping people up to date with what is going on and I suppose I, I, this is a question I've actually got in my mind yeah. we have job descriptions in the beginning yeah. And job descriptions when you first start, they might change over time. That's so right. how yeah. do you make sure that you keep on top of that as, as the business changes, as the, as the needs change? Yeah, look, I think there's a couple of tips you can you can kind of take away there that can really help with that. I think number one is communication. Yep. Um, I think communication can overcome a lot of issues. And as you said, businesses grow, businesses change. Um, all sorts of things can, can change an employment relationship. And in fact, it often does. Yep. Um, that's that's kind of what often engages an employee to stay is the fact that there's new challenges, new opportunities. But if you communicate through that, if you keep your employees in, in the loop in terms of that communication cycle, if you make sure that they, they're they coming along with you on that journey as a business owner is in terms of growing your business, mm-hmm. they will often, they'll, they'll often be on board. They'll often work with you to help your business be more successful. Yep. They'll often be more tolerant if perhaps things don't go exactly you know the, the way you expect and <laughs> things really ever do go exactly the way that you expect so yes. i think having that really strong communication having that joint uh, you know that joint vision that 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 kind of joint enterprise in terms of the business can can really help to to make sure that as the business grows as things change mm-hmm. the employees on board and, and and they're meeting you you know when you're when you're when you're making those changes when you want to you know expand your business if you want to try out new areas you want to do whatever it is the yep. employees there along with you it's not coming into complete shock to them, it, it, exactly and, and and i think you know new zealand has a very laid back 
um, kind of culture and, and, yeah. and we run into, we often run into a lot of employers who have taken that sort of laid back approach with their employees. And that often works really well for perhaps the first couple of years. Mm -hmm. And then things change or, you, you know, uh, economy may change and, and the business may become tighter. The margins may become tighter. And, and, and there's often, that often motivates a, a need for change within the business. And the employee that's been used to this, you know, kind of more laissez-faire approach or things working a certain way, yep. you know, the business owner may have been thinking about these challenges that they've been facing for perhaps the last six, 12, nine months, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. um, and then they go to roll it out with their employee and they get big pushback from their employee because it is coming as a shock to them, as you said. So yep. it's, it, it, I think it's a, it's, it's a sometimes not a very Kiwi thing to do is, is, is to be communicative and, and to have that really kind of um, open joint relationship. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it is, I think what's really needed, if, particularly if you're a growing business, if you're a changing business. Yeah. Part of the EOS model actually kind of advocates for, you know, first of all, weekly meetings at all yep. levels. Yep. So everybody's always across the board and cascading messages, they go up and down so people know what is happening at the senior leadership team level. Yep. And then having a sort of a joint, uh, we call it the state of the company update mm. at least once a quarter, yep. which is like telling people, you know, this is where we were, we were headed. Yep. This is what we've managed to achieve. This is what, what, what hasn't worked. This is what has worked. Yep. And here's the next quarter and, and sharing that, that journey so that nothing comes as a surprise. Uh, this is right, and that's, that's both beneficial from a, just from an engagement point of view with your employees, keeping yep. them engaged and, and on board, but also from a legal point of view. You actually have a legal obligation as an employer to be open and communicative with your employees. So you, you should be you should be not you know, obviously you don't have to communicate everything. And, <laughs> yeah, and, sometimes and, it's best not to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, obviously some elements remain confidential, but yep. as much as is possible, you have an obligation. Um, I think legally and, and perhaps also morally to communicate with your employees and keep them up to date with what's happening. Yeah, and I think I see a lot. When businesses grow quite quickly so you think of in the beginning when it's a small business mm. you might have five six seven let's say ten people yeah. um, and it's really easy to keep those communication lines yeah. open because it's a small team you can meet on a regular basis you, you're catching up with each other and then it grows from 10 to 20 to 100 people yeah. and all of a sudden those you know that communication is a lot tougher right because you, right. you just can't have a an all-staff meeting every week exactly. and have a chat about what's going on That's right. yeah. yeah so what do you kind of recommend in terms of um, keeping a bigger team engaged I think that's really weird policies, processes, documentation can be can be a really helpful tool. Um, as you spoke about, when you're a smaller business, you can often do a lot of that verbally, mm -hmm. perhaps just over email or, 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 you know, kind of more informal methods. Yep. The bigger you grow, if you want to maintain that, that very consistent culture across all elements, all levels of your business, you really need to document, you really need to have process guides for, for everything that you're doing, not just for the employees, but also if you've got middle managers or, or managers in between, you, you've often got a business owner that has a really clear vision. Yep. Yep. of what they want. They're really passionate about what they're doing. You might also have employees like that, but things get lost in translation. Yeah. And so so having really clear procedures for employees, but also for managers, you know, guys in terms of the way they should be dealing with employees or, or the ability for employees to, to potentially skip their manager and go to the owner or to, to a high level manager. That's what really allows you to keep that same sort of success, that same sort of cohesion yep. or consistency even as you grow and you start to add more and more levels or layers to your business. Mm. We have a thing called um, also like a, quarter, a quarterly conversation, which mm. is a, a more informal discussion as well, which I, yeah. I highly, so you've got the, you've got the, the formal side that you, you want to do, but there's also yep. an opportunity for these people to actually feedback on what's working, what's not That's working right. for them and how they're going in their role, how they're going against the values, yeah, exactly. having those conversations. But even though they're informal, they're still regular. So they are booked into the yep. calendars. People know that they're coming and then they've got, they feel like they've got a chance to actually have input. Yeah, that, that's right. And, and the more you communicate, as you spoke about earlier, the more we communicate with your employees, the more yep. that they feel part of it, the, the more they're going to play their part in terms of having the business succeed. And especially if the business changes, like I said, because let's face yep. it, we, sometimes we can't help it. Um, the that's last right. three years have been a great example of things yep. that are completely beyond our control yep. and can actually affect the business. Okay. Um, one of the things that we find as the business grows um, and you move away from being a smaller business to a slightly larger business mm. is you've got all these additional kind of layers, if you like, and different yeah. levels of people. Um, and then there'll be a time when maybe somebody who fitted in in the beginning of the business maybe doesn't doesn't work so much in, in where the business is headed because the roles have changed. Yeah. So it's not about the person. They might still share the company values, but they're, um, you know, they, they might not fit into the, the, yeah. the role that is evolving. Um, 
we have a thing called an accountability chart, which is where we actually go through and we go, right, what are the, the functions that we need and what do these roles look yeah. like? Um, and then we actually have a thing called GWC. We kind of go, does this person actually really get it? Do they want it? Do they have capacity to do it? Yeah. Which is a little bit of the, you know, do they get it in terms of what the role is about? Mm. Do they want it as in genuinely want it? Do they have the capacity to do it? What happens if you see a gap there? What happens if the, you know, the role is evolving and maybe the person isn't evolving with the role? How would you handle that? Uh, look, it kind of depends where you come where that problem kind of arises in terms of the life cycle as to what what approach you would take but yep. as with all issues the earlier you kind of catch it the earlier you, you deal with it yep. the easier it is to fix so mm. you know as you see the role changing or you know perhaps your values change and 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 that can happen all the time um just making sure that you're not to to, to keep on the same um, beat all the time, but communicating with your employees <laughs> yep, no, and, it's absolutely and, key, yeah. and making sure that that they understand that there's a change. Mm -hmm. um, you update, you know, if you've got perhaps a performance appraisal um, document and, and, and it has your old values or your old duties or your old vision, making sure that's updated regularly yep. and that you're assessing your employees against that you know the, the the most up to date, the most current version of what you're looking for. Yep. Um. You're using that with your employees because not only does that mean that, um, you know, you know what their capacity is or, or what they want to do that is. Yep. But they also know what's expected from them. Um. One of the biggest issues we often find with employees who are perhaps seen as lower performers by their by their managers or by their employers is that those employees don't actually understand what it is they should be doing yep. or what sort of goal they're heading towards. And so they haven't got those really measurables in place. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I always right. sort of joke because it's like it's, it's boundaries. We actually, as humans, we quite like boundaries. Yep. We like to know yep. what it, what it, what we can do, what we can't do. Yep. And we also like to know what we're aiming for as well because sometimes without those measurables, you feel like you right. you don't have anything. And then, of course, if you start to pick somebody up on performance and kind of go, well, you're not performing, that's right. well, based on what? <laughs> yes, and that's exactly right. And, and as I say, the, the biggest gap is often for poor performers is just not understanding and, and perhaps the manager or the owner having um, objectives or expectations mm -hmm. that that employee had no idea about. Yeah. And then often that's going to create a real big tension or a real big gap between the between the two parties. And it just comes back to communication again, it right? Does. It's miscommunication. It yeah. So it's like if you're not being really clear and sharing that clarity all the time, that's right. then there's an, there's error, there's room for error. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and I think Again, nine times out of ten, communication can fix most problems. Yep. You know, you'll get the odd one that that perhaps you can be a really clear, clear communicator in these two issues. But for the most part, I, you know, we are all human beings, and yeah. I think one of the difficulties of running a business is you're dealing with humans human every beings, day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and I think people just want to know what's happening. They want to know where they're going. They want to know um, how they're working with their colleagues to get there. Yeah, absolutely. We uh, we use a thing called a people analyzer, and, and I didn't get to share this with you outside, but mm. it's it's basically we put the, the core values across the top, and then we use it to actually analyze how the person is going with those core values. Yeah. And we have a really, really simple methodology. So if you are 90% of the time you are uh, exhibiting the core value, you get a tick. Yeah. If you're kind of flip-flopping, you get a plus minus. If you're really not exhibiting that core value you get a minus mm. um, and and I always sort of think the plus minus is where there is room for improvement for you as a leader as well right yeah. understanding what's really causing that because if somebody's flip-flopping it doesn't mean that they don't share that core value it just means something is probably going on for them yeah and really inconsistent performance is, is a really um clear early warning sign that perhaps some, uh, and performance is dropping or there may be major issues later on. Mm -hmm. As I said earlier, if you can nip that in the bud really, really quickly or, or early, yep. you'll, the employee will be happier and yes. you'll probably be happier as a business owner because your employee is doing what you want them to do and they're going towards that vision. So, you know, that sort of flip-flopping that, 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 Sometimes they're good, sometimes perhaps not so good. Yep. Those are really the times you want to step in and intervene. And they're red flags, aren't they? I mean, exactly. It's a red flag that there's something going on that yeah. you need to look at as a leader, as a manager, and see what's really going on. That's right. And, and again, Kiwi culture, I think people tend to, to not <laughs> really deal with issues until it's, until it's a really big issue. Yes. And, and that's a really hard thing to do. And, and yeah. we often help employers in, in very difficult situations, and it's tough. And mm. it's really emotionally draining on, on those employees. It's financially draining on their business. Yep. Those ones that can, can give us a call early or, or, or look to nip it in the bud early. Those are the ones where we can overcome those fairly easily and, and, you know, have that really, um, continued success or, yeah. or keep growing. And. We are all humans, right? Which means we do stuff up. Yep. You know, with all the best intentions in the world, there are times when we just act, we make a mistake. That's right. Even as leaders and managers, yep. right? Yep. <laughs> and sometimes that, you know, that can, that can blow out of proportion. I've seen it happen where mm. actually some, a tiny little thing that was just a mistake has blown yep. into this massive big issue. What do you do in that situation? 
Look, uh, most we we do see that a lot. I have to say, we have a yep. lot of our clients that call into employer and 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 what looks to us as a ver- relatively minor issue is actually a really big issue for our clients. And when we kind of dig in and we speak to our clients about well, what's what's really What's what's really driving this this anxiety or this or this worry with you with this issue and and what we often see under the surface is that there's actually a whole lot of other issues that 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 have kind of been um, bubbling away under the surface that haven't been dealt with and and you get the one issue that kind of breaks the straw that breaks the camel's back yes. essentially so yeah. you know if you have again not repeating the same thing as before but if you have a minor issue deal with it early yeah. um, don't you know don't kind of put it to the side brush under the carpet oh look it's just one time. I hope I hope it goes away yeah. because you do that three or four times and suddenly you've got a big problem. Mm. Um, and, and that's that's th- that's the clients who we see really struggle, the ones that are more proactive about dealing with. And you can do it in a really informal, quick way. You just pull the person aside, have a really informal chat to them. Hey, look, I saw you did this. I've, here's a bit of here's a tip about how you can avoid that in the future, or yeah. here's how I can help you stop yourself getting into the situation in the future. And, and I think employees really appreciate that sort of uh, regular feedback and, mm-hmm. and formal feedback. Um, I think when you when you make it a really formal process or it's a bigger issue and you're dealing with it, that's where you start to get some pushback from the employee. So because yeah, they feel with, a bit persecuted, that, then, don't that's they? right. Or, or they feel like they that was it, it's happened a couple of times before and it wasn't you an didn't issue say then. Anything. Yeah. So why is it an issue now? Yeah. So so dealing with it. In an informal way, yep. um, making sure you're being upfront about it. Um, you've got to be, you know, you've got to front foot some of these issues. Um, mm-hmm. If you do that, then it, it avoids them bubbling into bigger issues or, or building into issues that perhaps um, become outside of your control. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's why we kind of advocate for weekly meetings and yep. actually having those weekly conversations. And yep. and also, I, I think you made a really good point. Like, don't have that critique in front of all of their peers either. Yep. It's like, pull them aside, um, have that conversation about mm. what's going on rather than putting them on the spot in front of everybody else. That's right. Um, but it needs to be dealt with as soon as it happens as opposed to letting it, you know, because I think the thing about boundaries is boundaries are set because they are consistent and they're repeated over and over again. Yep. And if you allow a certain behavior to happen and it happens you know once or twice without being picked up yeah. then you're basically moving that boundary and going this is acceptable it, it, exactly and i think when employees feel like they're being treated unfairly and that's a great example of when they often do feel like they're being treated unfairly mm-hmm. that's where you really start to get that tension that's where you get the breakdown of that relationship yep. um, employees that that know where the boundaries are where the walls are where they can step where they can't step um, although that may seem like it's a bit more controlling it's actually helpful for them and employees often appreciate that um, a lot more than they do more vague and big US kind of instructions or expectations. Mm. If, if you do sort of feel that maybe the relationship isn't working as well as it can, um, I know you're a lawyer, so I'm, I'm asking more from it. Is it is it okay to have an informal conversation or are you better to follow a performance management procedure? I'm just wondering, where's, where's the starting point? Yeah. For when you're feeling unhappy, yeah. um, where is the starting point? I, I would say the starting point is always an, an informal conversation. Yep. Um, I mean, you can jump straight to formal if you want to, but that is a more contentious process mm. and, and it often comes with a bit more push and shove, so to speak. Yeah. So if you start with that informal conversation, um, Perhaps the employee may, may really be really responsive to that. They may make the change and yeah. done perfect. Yeah, um, and it doesn't eliminate your ability to deal, to have a more formal process after that. Okay. So we always advocate for an escalation of, of, of steps. So yep. you start with that really informal process, maybe a quick chat, yeah. pull them aside, maybe in their one to one. If that doesn't work, then perhaps you put in an email, you put it in writing. Um, you can perhaps reiterate it in, in, a, in a letter or in an update to the job description. Yep. If that's still not working, you've had those sorts of conversations and the employee is still below expectations or still causing major issues within the organization, then you've got that formal ability, you've got the ability to go formal and have a really formal process mm-hmm. um, and, and make really clear what your expectations are. Yep. And if they're still not being met, you know, to, to look at more formal more disciplinary formal things, outcomes. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it, it comes down to, I mean, I've seen a lot of businesses that I work with is that we always say that every single person should have at least one measurable. Yeah. That's their boundary, right? That's This is what we expect from these are the outcomes we expect that's measured on a regular basis yeah. and therefore you can have those conversations where it's not being met. Mm. If you haven't got those measures in place, it makes those conversations more difficult, doesn't it? It does. It makes it more difficult in terms of trying to communicate to your employee what yeah. they expect. It makes it more difficult in terms of showing them where perhaps they have fallen short. Mm-hmm. It can be really hard if you don't have something to measure against to actually get the employee to even accept that they have fallen short of your yeah. expectations. And, and it, it can become personal, I think. Or it fe- no, sorry, I shouldn't say it, can become, it feels yeah. more personal because we're not talking about facts and figures, but we're talking about, well, I don't believe that you've performed well. That's, that's yeah. right. <laughs> oh, no, you're, you're spot on, absolutely. And, and and those are the sorts of relationships that we often see that the biggest issues in is where 
um, either both the, either the employer or the employee feel there's a personal aspect to mm-hmm. it. Um, uh, so, so really making it as, as impersonal as, as you possibly can, making it objective as you possibly can, not only helps you in terms of processes and, and speed of resolving that, but it also leaves more options open for you from a legal point of view as well. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it's, it's kind of got that dual benefit. Hmm. Um, so that that when it comes down to the the role and what's expected in your role delivery, that becomes quite easy. When it comes down to a values kind mm. of fit, so um, sometimes I mean, oh, this is just from my personal experience. You know, you can interview people and they can come across um, wonderfully. You can do a reference check and they're they're absolutely you yeah. know they they get um, they're, they're never going to give you a reference. It's not a great reference. <laughs> but let's let's be realistic yeah. about it. And so you know, you employ the person, then they actually come out of the job, and then suddenly you realise that there actually is a bit of a, a values mismatch. Yeah. I mean, obviously, the best thing to do is to make sure that you do as much possible up front to make sure that they do fit with the values. That's right. But what happens if they just don't quite fit in? What are the options there? Yeah, I mean, values can be an element of performance. Okay. So employer sure is it actually a value driven organization and in our regular performance reviews Mm -hmm. we have a value section where we score people against our various values that we have so there's a there's a there's a kind of more formal objective aspect in terms of the data and there's also a section on value so you know treat a value like any other performance metric how are they performing against that value? And again, mm. if you if you see a long standing issue with an employee um, being inconsistent with your values as an organisation, or perhaps not living up to your values, you can treat that as a, as any as a as the same as any other sort of performance, performance metric. Issue. Okay. You know, as if it was late, can be the same as if perhaps they're not you know living up to that to that client as king or customer comes first sort of value as well. Sure, and I think, but it's important that you actually give specific examples, isn't it? There's no point in just saying, "Hey, That's look, right. I, I gave you a minus, yeah. Lawrence. I think you're a minus when it comes to being humbly confident." Yeah. You kind of go, "Well, what? You've got to give some some reference points to yeah. go. This is the um, the the behaviour I've observed, or this is what I saw you do, and give them some actual. I always say like three reference points is quite that, nice. That's right. There, yep. There's kind of two elements to every performance sort of process. One element is that kind of guide to what the employee should be doing, whereas you say examples of what living up to these values can mean. Yeah. And then the other document is how they measure against those values yep. and those two documents in combination can really uh, make sure that you're you're on the right track and you're keeping your employees on track in terms yeah. of their so we call it the core value speech and the core value speech is about you know you go through the values is it, so what it means around here what it means what yeah. we do do what we don't do yeah. and again it's about boundaries if, if you don't actually if you don't clearly articulate that from the beginning mm. it's really hard for somebody to understand right. what that what there is expected of them yeah and not only that but it also you know if you have a couple of employees that perhaps aren't living up to those values mm-hmm. when you have a new employee that comes in they're going to copy that behavior. Yes. If you've got a whole lot of employees that are living up to those values and are, are really values driven and, 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 and everyone's in line and pointing in the same direction, when a new employee comes in, they're going to fall in line with everybody else. If you have a couple of people that are falling short or have values issues, that can spread very, very quickly mm. amongst an organization. I call so, it the rotten apple effect. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So it's not just about dealing with that employee. It's not just the benefit of being able to resolve it more easily if you address it quickly. Yeah. It also has the benefit of flowing through to other employees as well. Sure. No, okay. So I, I didn't realize that, that it really is um, the same as any other performance metrics. As long as you've been really clear and upfront, that's that this right. is what we expect of you, yep. then you are absolutely able to hold them just as accountable as to whether or not they're achieving their KPIs that we call it, yep. we call it um, measurables, but yeah, the things that we're expecting of them in the role. Yeah, absolutely. The employment law in New Zealand, although it can be tough and it's, it's got a lot of uh, kind of trap doors you can fall into, <laughs> yes. it does, it's not necessarily prescriptive in terms of the way you have to run your business. Okay. You can run your business in whatever way you like, mm-hmm. so long as you're being open and communicative with your employees so long as you're doing it in a way that allows your employees to succeed yep. um, and that if you are, if there are issues that they would be dealt with in a fair way it doesn't go beyond that in terms okay. of the, how you need to, how you need to do you know, what your values are or yep. what your performance metrics are or how you address those sorts of performance issues it's, it's up to you as a business owner as an organization um, to decide how you want to do that yep. so long as you're being open and communicative and clear and constructive with your employees yeah and as you said that they're having the boundaries knowing what they can and they can't do that's so right. there's no there's no confusion it all comes down to communication it does, doesn't it, it does. Absolutely. <laughs> and, 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 and that's not sort of un- unrealistic it's, it's yeah. a relationship right and every single it relationship is. is based on communication yeah. Yeah. and yeah. I'm speaking to clients clients or, or I'm, I'm training new advisors that come into our team, I, I talk about as if it was a, a, one of your personal relationships, mm. it's the same thing. Yes. Um, and it can go really well for a yep. long period of time and then suddenly it doesn't work anymore. Yep. And 
it, it's maybe it's not quite as easy to, to break up an employment relationship <laughs> as it is a personal relationship, but the same sorts of approaches apply. And if you're communicative in your personal relationships, mm-hmm. you're going to be successful and the same applies in your employment relationships as yeah. well. Yeah. I think it's really important too. Sometimes we kind of feel really worried, particularly if you've had somebody in your business for a long, 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 long time yeah. um, and and it's no longer working, which can, which can happen in any relationship. As you said, it can yeah. happen in your personal relationships, happens in business relationships. Um, I think people are kind of like, you know, they're nervous about sort of dealing with that because the person has been around for a long time. We don't want to upset them. But the yeah. chances are if you're unhappy as an employer, they're probably unhappy as an employee too. That's and right. in some respects, it's almost, it's kinder to have those conversations and to have those discussions mm. and understand if there really is a fit anymore. Because if there isn't and they do have to go somewhere else, That's right. they're probably going to find somewhere where they're happier too. Yeah, exactly. And, and often when I'm dealing with employees or employees are in difficult situations um, and, and there may be, there's a really contentious um, point in terms of what we're, what we're discussing a certain issue and what I often say is that it can actually be better for both parties for the relationship mm-hmm. to be over yep. or for you know you, if you're not happy in your work yeah. your, your, your employer is never going to be happy either and as an employer if you're not happy your employees aren't going to be happy so yeah. you need to have both parties playing their part mm-hmm. if one party isn't playing their part no matter how good the other one is <laughs> it's, it's probably never going to work to be honest and, and look it's a fact of life that not Everybody is right for for a certain role, and and certain people thrive in situations, and and the same people can can really struggle in that same situation. So, yes. it's 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 not a bad thing necessarily if a relationship doesn't work out. Yeah. Um, it, it, what is what can be really difficult is if you try to force that to work or you try to jam a square peg into a round hole essentially. Yeah. So sometimes I think both employees and employers need to need to say. Look, perhaps it's time to move on or perhaps it's time to, to make a fundamental change in the way that we do things because what we're doing now isn't really working. Mm. I, and I think um, going back to us or GWC, that's the, 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 what, the W is the want, right? Yeah. And I think that even if you get your and you're capable of doing it, if you don't really want that's to right. do it, it's actually bad for both parties because right. you're you're into a, a situation where you're not enjoying going to work and you're not going to bring the best sleep to the, the, the best value to the business either. That, that's right. And, and, and you know, uh, uh, what was it last year? I think there was a lot of talk about quiet quitting, and, and oh, that's yes. a really great example of that. Is is you may be a really capable person, yep. but if you're not motivated to do it, you're not going to do great work, mm-hmm. and then you're actually going to become even more unhappy as an employee because your employee is going to start coming down on you. Yeah, so, so it creates it, a, a constant it, cycle, it, right? Ex- yeah. Exactly, and, and then you're going to be even more unhappy, and then it goes back and forth <laughs> forever. So, uh, you know, it, if you don't want to be somewhere. Don't be there is, is, is kind of the, the sort of advice that I would give to yep. employees particularly, um, but also from an employer's point of view, they may think an employee doesn't want to be there. Um, perhaps they do, perhaps they don't. But what you really want to explore is opportunities um, before you get to that point yep. to try to have a really constructive relationship to maintain that relationship. If you've done all of that yep. and it still isn't working, then yeah, perhaps time to move on. But mm. before you get there, you've got to you've got to put a bit of effort in, basically. And as I said, I mean, when we do the whole um, people analyze, I think I think that whole plus or minus is it's just an opportunity to sort of say, what can I be doing better? Because we yeah. as leaders have a responsibility right. to get the best out of our people. Yeah. And so if somebody is underperforming or isn't, you know, is um, we have having some challenges with you've got to actually first of all find out what's really going on for them That's and right. what can we do to support them That's right. because it could just I've heard horrible examples of people when they actually get asked you know what's really going on for you mm. and they tell you something horrific that's happening at home and you cannot separate right. I know it, it, it sounds really lovely there's personal life there's professional yeah. life there's not there's a human life That's right. it's one life That's and right. so you know what is going on at home will affect you mm. in your work environment and I think as an employee it's not our role to to solve that but it's to be um you know, supportive of that and seeing what can be done or what can't be done. That's right. And, and the Employment Relations Act, the main piece of legislation in New Zealand that governs employment relationships, is actually written in such a way that it, it places obligations on employers. It mm-hmm. gives rights to employees. It's built on a, a, a philosophy that there's a power imbalance in an employment relationship. So <laughs> by, by, by being constructed in that way, it often places the onus on the employer to have a go at fixing that issue. Right. Um, and, and again, the, the employers that we see, our clients that we see that are really successful are the ones that are proactive. And the ones that we see often get into hot water yep. are the ones that are a bit more passive and they, and they let issue, issues kind of wash over them until it becomes unbearable. unbearable. Yep. If you're proactive about it, if you're going to an employee that you see that is, is perhaps not performing as you expected or there's a value disalignment, mm-hmm. you go to that employee and, and sometimes you've got to pull it out of them. Yep. You know, they're not always going to be really forthcoming <laughs> in terms of the issues that they have, yep. be it at work or be it in their personal life. Sometimes you do have to pull it out of them. But when you do, um, you can often see it often becomes very clear 
I've got this really great solution I can roll out. Yep. Um, and, and you do that and suddenly it's a really back to a really productive employment relationship. So you have to be proactive as an employer. Mm-hmm. You have to address those issues head on. Um, you have to want to resolve them. Um, you can't just sit back and, and hope that an issue is going to resolve itself because chances are it probably won't. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, so the the, key, the, the really key things are communication, communication, communication. That's really. right, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, and having sometimes the difficult conversations but yeah. with an open view to what might come out of it. That's right. Yeah. So dealing with the issues, bringing them to the forefront, not, I suppose, not letting, um, it fester. Is that the right word? Yeah, Where, yeah. So, yeah, cause yeah, a small issue can suddenly be blown complete out of portion. Yeah. Communication is an interesting one. Um, there is a propensity, I would mm. say, um, in New Zealand to be a little bit passive aggressive in terms of communication, yeah. which means that email is kind of one of the most favored tools yeah. because, you know, I can, I can just write it. And, I, right. and I've caught myself doing it at times, <laughs> you know, you kind of start, um, typing out an email and, and realize even in the way that you're bashing the keys probably means you're not in the right state to yep. be writing an email. Um, so you have to catch yourself on that. But email is wonderful for recording, you know, absolute events, uh, you know, and, and, and clarifying things, yep. but it's not the best place to start, is it? It's no, absolutely not. And, and, and as you say, email can, can be really clear in terms of a very black and white approach, but yep. it often, you often lose the implication or you, you lose the subtlety of the message you're trying to give yes. to an employee or to anyone really. So what we always recommend is you have an in-person meeting, you discuss it with your employee. Yep. If you can't have it in person, even over the phone yep. or even by, by Zoom. By teams, Zoom, yep, you know, yep. it, 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 That's better than just by email. Yep. And then you follow it up with an email after that. And sure. the email can be a good record of what was discussed. This is a confirmation or, of what was discussed exactly. as opposed to awesome clarification around some points, but not employer chance to come back and say oh no that isn't what I why that's not what I took away from it or yep. perhaps I've got a different expectation it allows you to kind of pull out those issues but you, you're never really going to be able to get across particularly for example a values driven message you want to give yeah it's really hard to deliver values over email yes so to having the in-person the opportunity to have that in-person conversation to be able to deliver it with you know business owners are really passionate about what they do they're not in business you know often for the money they're in it because they're passionate yes. <laughs> yeah. and that passion comes across in person it often doesn't cr- come across an email yeah I think I'm half German and so I'm, I'm actually quite blunt and I often catch yeah. myself I catch myself writing emails and I, and yeah. I haven't even done the niceties like hi how are you yeah. or any of that stuff and so you'll be very so and I, and I don't and I don't ever intend for it to be blunt I don't intend for it to be yeah. um, to the point it's just the way that I compose emails yeah. and often that can be taken the wrong way because That's they right. don't see so I've actually I've even added a, a photo to the bottom of my emails yeah. just to remind people that actually they're dealing with a human because yeah. you know when we send off the emails it's like the the keyboard warriors right you've still got another person another human at the other end and who's That's receiving right. that and you've got to be careful about how they um, actually receive that. Yeah, yeah. And, and there's, there's lots of examples that we see. We see it all the time actually where um, a, a, an employee takes an email the wrong way. They they take yeah. it as a as an attack on them or they yes. take it as a as a demand they've got to do this. And then when they when the two parties meet and discuss it, mm-hmm. It's actually fine. Yeah. Um, they actually were both on the same page in the first place. So, yes. you know, it, it's really hard to get. And we actually see clients use like things like emojis all the time as a way to, <laughs> you can actually add some emotion or some subtlety to an email, perhaps. I mean, it's never going to replace in person conversations, but no, you've got to be really conscious of that. That's interesting, isn't it? Because, I mean, I think that um, particularly some of the older people would kind of go, oh, you know, emojis are unprofessional. You yeah. can't use emojis. I actually use them all the time, mm. even though I'm old. Um, and I do think it's just a little bit of that sort of, yeah, trying to, to, to soften down something that I know might might come across um, as a little bit sort of um, less, yeah, a little bit more blunt than most people would say it, and it's yeah. and it's not meant that way. So exactly. I use the smiley face, or I use the yeah, yeah. The, 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 the I actually quite like the champagne cheers one quite a lot. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So, so, so it's not unprofessional to use emojis in your emails. I mean, this is, for some business, they'll probably say, what is Oh, if, if you've got banks run, run, running yeah. out to a customer, for example, that's a little bit different. Sure. I, I, you know, I think if you, if you can't, perhaps you can't have that conversation in person or you are trying to deliver what could come across as a, as a harsh message, sometimes yep. using those extra tools that you have yep. can, can help to get across, as they say, that, that more unspoken human. element of it, the yep. human element of it. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. Um, working from home has become sort of yes. uh, this whole hybrid working model. It's kind of interesting because um, we had to change our business model quite significantly just because we couldn't get together in person with yeah. leadership teams. So we got into doing online and, and you know, it works. I, I would still pick face-to-face over it any day, yeah. um, but you can do it. But more and more people, and, and personally, um, when I advertise for a job, I actually said it's in-person, yeah. not negotiable. That's the way I want to work. And as the employer, I'm allowed to choose the yeah. way that I want That's to work, right. right? Yeah. But if you if people who do choose to go in the hybrid model or the work-from-home model, it changes the dynamics of the teams, doesn't it? It, it absolutely does. And, and, and I think you 
brought a really raised really good point there is that you've got to be clear from day one yeah. about what your expectation is. If you're going to have a hybrid model, mm -hmm. are you going to agree on which days they're going to be in the yeah. office and which days they're going to be home? Or are you going to let the employee choose those? And if you let the employee choose those, it can be really hard later on to actually reverse that or say, actually, I want you to come again, in today, yeah. particularly because I've got a big <laughs> client coming in or whatever yeah. it may be. So it's, it's having those really clear, that really clear expectation set from day one. Mm -hmm. um, uh, is it a fully from office role? Is it a fully from home role? Is it a hybrid role if it's hybrid how does you know, that on work basis. yep and then having policies and documents that support that that you've got the employee signature on that you can that you can use if there is a dispute or if there's yep. a misunderstanding later on because you know sometimes expectations will be very clear at the start with an mm -hmm. employee yep six months 12 months go on and suddenly you start to drift apart in terms of what each party expects. And if you can come back to a founding document yep. that sets out what the expectations were from day one, you can keep that same sort of consistent approach the whole way through. So I think working from home, is it, it can be a really difficult situation, yep. um, particularly, at, you know, the market is the way at the moment. It's a very employee-driven market. Mm -hmm. um, employers are often having to give extra benefits to employees to attract the right staff that you want. Yes. Um, work from home is, was, was, is one example that employees are still using to attract staff yep um but if you're going to offer that to your employees you've got to ask yourself are you comfortable for that to be in place for the entirety of the employment relationship yeah, because that's what you agree to in the beginning that's you right. can't you can't change well you can change the rules midway through but you have to do it with agreement with other people you can't that's just right. go and um you know yeah you know yeah, I mean, kind you, of change you it. can do it unilaterally, unilaturally um, that's what but, but thinking, yeah. <laughs> with a really it, it, it's quite an in-depth process you've got to go through a full consultation process with the employees you particularly you might you might have to make the role redundant if they don't agree right um, and then potentially redeploy them into a new role that has different kind of conditions or models of working mm -hmm. that can be a really not not just a really complex and resource intensive process but also a potentially legally risky process to take as well and sure and and often changes like that are done because the uh, the, the company is in a difficult circumstance mm -hmm. the last thing you want to do is add more risk by having to to change terms that employees are really attached to so yeah you absolutely have to think about the entirety of the relationship when you start yes and, and not kind of think short term and, and say how well, this is works really well for now yeah we need to employ some people right now so we should offer work from exactly. home exactly be prepared to stick with that decision exactly <laughs> is it going to work for you in another yep. year or two years or five years or ten years, years? that's right exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah okay and so i, I mean I, I know i'm quite strong in my views i do like working in an office i like having people in the office with me is it okay for employers still to say this is a a full-time role in the office absolutely yeah um employers as you said employers have the right to decide the way they want the business to be run mm -hmm. um the, the way they want their employees to work yeah and if an employee doesn't like that they won't take the job yeah and if and, and actually if if you try to compromise on your values or compromise on, on your vision too much to just to get an employee in you're often setting yourself up for failure, failure later in the future. on yeah. because that's going to come to a head that issue is going to going to going to explode out into a big mess basically so so i think getting the right people on from the start being very clear about what you want how you want your business to be run mm -hmm. what sort of employee is going to work really well in your organization can make for a much more fruitful relationship um, later on even if perhaps it takes you a little bit longer to find the right person at the start. Sure. Now, you talked about, obviously, as an employer, we can't change those rules given that we employ them on that basis. What happens when the employee wants to change the way that things happen? Because I have seen this mm. happen quite a lot uh, where, you know, let's just say you have been, I'll give a, a, a fictional example, but you've been employed on a, we're working in the office yep. five days a week, and then all of a sudden the employee sort of says, well, I would like to work from home for two days a week. Yep. How do you deal with that as an employer? Um, well, employees have the right to ask for that. They have okay. the right to submit flexible working requests through the Employment Relations Act. It sets out a process for the way that employees can do that. Mm -hmm. And employers have an obligation both under that section in terms of flexible working, but also under their general obligation of good faith to be open and communicative to consider that, but yep. not necessarily to agree to that. Okay. So as an employer, what you should do is, is make sure you've received that, make sure you've got a process where employees can make those applications. Mm -hmm. When you receive one, you consider it, you look at it from the employee's point of view, you, you discuss it with the employee, perhaps here if they've got more elements to add to it in person, um, and you consider it, you know, with an open mind. Yep. But you don't necessarily have to agree to it. So, so long as you've gone through that process, so long as you've considered it, you've given it genuine, genuine thought, yep. genuine consideration. If you decide it's not right for your business, that's fine. Yep. You're entitled to do that as an employer, but you've got to go through that process to consider it in the first place. You can't just say no. No. You know, where I'm not taking any applications to work from home. I'm not taking any applications to change hours. Right. You, you've got to, at you've least got to be open to, to it. Yep. Don't have to agree. And yep. in fact, you know, the X um, says that 
um, you, an employee can't challenge a decline of a flexible working request, but they can challenge when an employer hasn't considered it. Right. Yep. So, so the act literally says you have to consider it, yep. but you don't have to agree to it. Okay. Fair enough. And I suppose it's, it's also, I mean, if you, if the employee is a good employee, you might want to look at some, some other way of making it work. And so it is a That's negotiation right. process. Yeah. So we discuss all the possible options. We can look at what the That's actual right. resolution is. Yep. And, 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 you know, you might have a certain limit that you'd be willing to accept and the yep. employee might want to go beyond that and, and you can negotiate about where that we where you draw that line I, I would say the only other element you've got to be aware of though particularly if you're giving extra benefits to good employees is yep. that you also have an obligation to treat all your employees and fairly yeah, yeah. Um, and not, not necessarily i mean you can treat employees in disparate ways so right. long as there is a strong justification in doing that so you know perhaps you you do give employees an extra bonus or a commission or extra rights uh, or benefits yep. that, that's fine to do so long as you have a, a, a trial where you can show these are the performance metrics i'm basing it on yep. and if an, uh, another a lower performing employee that asked for that same benefit and got declined for it There's so long reason. as you can show hey look your performance wasn't wasn't as high as this other employee that that is getting this benefit so if you've got the paperwork you've got the processes you've got the objective kind of model to 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 show that yep. you know you'll be in a good position if you don't you, you could, could potentially get, you know, a, yep. a disparity of treatment claim from employees. That's a discrete claim that an employee can raise. Right. Interesting. So, I mean, I think in general, what I'm taking from this is that the law here says that, you know, we have to act with, um, oh, what's the right word? Sort of openness yes. and, um, would we'll be willing to have the conversations, we have the discussions to see both sides of the, of the, the, the equation, the point yep. of view, um, and to, yeah, to work together to get the best result. That's absolutely right. I mean, the Employment Relations Act is built on this, what they call the obligation of good faith. And that yep. implies, that applies to both employees and to employers. And you've got to be open and communicative. That's what good yep. faith means in action, essentially. Right. Be yep. open and communicative. Um, your employees should do that with you as an yes. employer. And as an employer, you should do that with your employees as well. And if you do that, chances are you're on the right track. Yeah. You, you're going to have a successful business um, and you're probably going to also be legally compliant. Which is always a bonus. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Great. okay um, gosh, I could, there's so many questions I want to ask you, <laughs> but I think that's given us a fair insight into it because I think I think the biggest um, learning for me throughout this, this conversation is that you can be a values-based employer and you can treat yes. values exactly like you would any other measurable in the yes. business. And so don't feel afraid as long as you've been really clear about what they are up front and that's been right. really clear about what that means because it's not just about our value is humbly confident you yes. have to actually explain what humbly confident means yep. from a work perspective what it does mean what it doesn't mean set some boundaries around it and then it becomes a measurable just like any other That's measurable right. yep. and you continue to track it throughout the relationship then, yep. Yep, yep, yep. then you can absolutely do that perfect and then if we're going to make any changes to any part of their employment agreement if you like um, it has to be done openly it has to be done with communication um, we have to be willing to to listen to both sides and, and come to a decision that's right and, and that's, where, that's where that process kind of driven um, approach comes uh, yep. there's the employment relations that has a really process-driven approach. Yes. And that process is really about hearing the other side of the yep. equation. And if you do that, then, you know, you can probably make, you know, changes or you can probably do what it is that you want to achieve yep. so long as you do it in the right way through yep. that right process. And the process doesn't, it's not spelled out in terms of you must do this. Isn't it? it's, it's more about a, a framework, isn't it, that but, says that you need to have done yeah. these certain things. That's right. I mean, it, it's a bit of a mixed model. I, again, some of the complications of New Zealand employment <laughs> law is that some of it isn't sp spelled out in legislation, but yep. maybe is spelled out in case law so right. so certain processes probably are a bit more um there is a bit more kind of a clearer steps you know these the steps one two three four are spelled out yeah other processes perhaps are a bit more open to different approaches yeah um but also what the employment relations that also recognizes is that um different sizes of employers can also result in different processes right. so you know if you're in new zealand or spark <laughs> yeah. you're probably taking a really resource intensive uh, uh, process and and there's an expectation that you do that yeah. and there's actually been a recent case that said that public sector organizations have a bigger obligation than perhaps smaller you know to me, smaller I private organisations. Yep. You know, if you're a small sole trader with two or three employees, mm -hmm. then you're not going to have the same sort of resource base to be able to go through this really intensive process. Yep. You need to go through some process, yes, but not necessarily to the same level or to the same depth that might be expected from a larger a larger organisation. Okay. So what I'm taking from this is, you know, that you have to follow the process. Um, it is important that you have the conversations as, as soon as possible if you've That's got right. issues going on. Yep. Um, and they they often informal conversations to start off with before you take it to any 
kind of formal process. Correct. And then in reality, if it starts to get a bit sticky, you're best to get an expert involved because Absolutely. it sounds like it's not a it's not a black and white, this is the way things go. It can be very much down to interpretation and That's right. um, depending on what size you are, what the, e the laws exactly. are. Exactly. And the processes yeah. can change based on how long the employee's been employed for or what sort of role they do or how big your organization is. So yeah. it, it can be really difficult to understand all of your procedural obligations as an employer mm -hmm. if you don't have that sort of professional help or professional assistance kind of steering you in the right direction. Sure. So tell us a little bit about EmployShore because um, what, why, what does, why does EmployShore exist? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we just talked about a great example there. We, we, yeah. we really exist to help our clients um, have really successful businesses. So one of our visions is building better businesses, oh, yeah. um, building fairer and safer businesses. We want to help our clients succeed. Um, particularly in New Zealand, we, we focus mainly on small and medium-sized enterprises. Mm -hmm. So those more, you know, mum and dad, for lack of a better term, business yep. owners who are probably really passionate about what they do. Yeah. They're really passionate about driving trucks or building buildings or baking cakes or looking after kids or whatever it is that they do. Yes. Perhaps not so, you know, um, uh, knowledgeable about their legal obligations, particularly from an employment relations view or health and safety point of view. So yep. what we want to do is help to ease that burden, take some of that burden away from our clients so that they can focus on what they're really passionate about. Um, we do. We have a number of different service elements that we provide that help clients do that. But it's all, you know, it's all in the in the in the means of making them um, able to be compliant yep. in a way that works for their business, and in a way that means that they have to spend less time, energy, and money on it than they might otherwise have to. Yeah. So we really want our clients to focus on the things that they're really passionate about yep. and leave the legalese, leave the leave the messy stuff to us. Basically, they health and social that kind of stuff. So yeah. I mean, the, the idea is that we call them. Um, a fractional employee which means that you've kind of got somebody who's on your team who's not there full time yep. but that you can call upon as if they were part of your team as it, and when needed exactly and, and yep. we, we actually operate a 24 hour a day seven day a week 365 day a year advice line oh wow we get clients that call us at 3 a.m in the morning oh, really or yeah. we get clients that call us on christmas day or yes. new year's day yeah and we're available the whole time to help our clients with any issue that they have because we know that oh, issues can stress. pop up at any time yep um and and you know we've got a lot of tradies or or, or construction um, organizations or businesses and they are often on site you know yep. kind of 7 a.m to 7 p.m mm -hmm. and they do all of their admin at 10 p.m at night and, and we're really there to help them when they want to do it yep um, but also to do it in a way that helps them to be successful so if, if we can really make sure they're being compliant without compromising on their vision or their mm -hmm. values as an organization yep. then you're gonna have a really successful business I yeah. think you don't want to let the, the law get yeah. in the way basically yeah no that's fantastic okay um quickly three top tips what were your three kind of top tips for privately owned business employees yeah. well, yep. we've kind of spoken about communication already yes um, so, so I, I won't I won't beat that dead horse too much, but it's really, I think, about having policies, paper trails, documentations, contracts, not only is that a legal obligation, but it's also really important from, uh, you know, uh, making sure there's clear obligations or clear expectations and yep. really having a successful relationship and keeping those current, as we talked about at the start, yes. making sure you're changing those as you go along. Um, so that would be number one. Mm -hmm. I think number two is, is really about making sure that you get it right from day one. Um, we have a lot of clients and, and, and we can help out with that, but it's a lot harder to fix a problem after it's become a problem yep. than it is to stop the problem ha happening in the first mm -hmm. place. So being proactive, um, for example, making sure you're recruiting the right people, spending the time at the at the recruitment stage yep. rather than when it becomes a problem stage. Yes. Um, you know, maybe overcoming that that typical Kiwi culture of of, of being a bit more laid back and, and being proactive about it. Mm -hmm. um, yep. And I think it's 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 really about engaging, training, making sure your staff are on the same page as, as you are. If they are, if you're all moving in the same direction, you're gonna have a really successful business yep. and you're gonna have really happy employees that are gonna want to be there, are gonna attract further employees employees to your organization and are going to give you the best that they possibly can. Yep. So you've got to engage them, you've got to give them the opportunity, you've got to train them and support them to be successful. Mm -hmm. And it may seem like a big burn at the start, but it'll pay off in the long in run, space. I promise. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Giving them, we talk about, you know, they, there's the resources that they need, as in they need a computer and they need a phone, yeah. but they actually need time more That's than anything. Right. Time and, and training and, and, and yeah, to get them on board and keep them in the loop in terms of what's going on. That's right. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Perfect. Okay, cool. So what is the ideal client for Employee Shop? What does it look like and um, we mainly focus on as i said small and medium-sized enterprises and yep. um, we've got a, a we've got in, uh, clients from all industries basically so mm -hmm. industry-wise um will help you basically we've got yep. clients from trades and construction all the way to law firms for example as, as, oh, as wow. clients as yep. well but we're really looking at that kind of um, sme 
SME or even potentially micro SME type size. So maybe 10 to 20 employees. Yep. Having said that, we've got lots of sole traders. We've got some clients with thousands of employees. So we can help at that end. But it's really about those, those kind of middle growing organizations mm-hmm. that want support. Yep. Perhaps don't have the resources to get their own in-house lawyer or in-house HR advisor or, you know, to be able to pay a law firm to draft all their contracts. Yep. Um, they want that support, but they want to do it in a way that supports their growth. So we're, we're looking for those sorts of clients. Mm-hmm. Those are the sorts of clients that really form a really good relationship with us and we can really help succeed. And I think that's really important too. It's a little bit like using a, a virtual assistant agency is that mm. by having a team of people which EmployShore has, yeah. you've got lots of different specialists, right? Which means you're actually that's getting, right. you're paying for, you know, a fractional part of a role, but you can actually tap into the various different areas as and when needed. So you've that, got health and safety, you've got right. contracts, you've got disputes. Yep, and, and exactly. Yep. And so we, you know, we help all the way from the, the formation of the, the documentation. We'll go out to an employer's site and, and draft all the documentation. I talked about our 24-hour um, a, a day, seven day a week advice line. Yep. We've got a legal team that can help if you get those really sticky, messy situations. Yep. Um, and we've got a team that can come out and visit you face to face as well, if you like. And kind of to, to the point you made earlier as well, a really diverse set of advisors within our organization. Yep. So, you know, I come from a employee focused background. I, I working at community law, we've got yes. clients, our employees that come from unions, from large organizations, from medium sized organizations that, that come from all walks of life. Some have qualifications, some come from retail backgrounds. Mm-hmm. Um, we want to understand our clients' businesses. And if we do that, that we can help them succeed. So chances are we've got someone that can help you. Oh, that is fantastic. I tell you what, honestly, there's, um, this has actually been quite reassuring for me because I've always thought, I've always found that the, I've worked in Australia, I've worked in the US, and I've worked over here, and yeah. I always thought the New Zealand employment law was probably one of the most difficult ones. It is. But, but I think that at the same time, what you've actually made me realize is that there is a way through it, and it really is about being open, having that communication, and, and just making sure that you're, you're on the same page. Um, and when you're not, you, right. you resolve it. Yeah? yeah. It's not about trying to make, it's not trying to kind of bundle the employment law to the side and trying to work around it. No, if, no, no. If you can work with it, in unison, yes. it can really help your business succeed. It cannot have to be a barrier in your yeah. way that you have to jump over. And if you do that proactively, then, you know, who knows what the limits are. No, that is fantastic. Hey, look, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate you coming in. Thank you. It's um, great to be here. Uh, thank you. And if you want to contact Lawrence, you can find him, I think, on the EmployShore yep. um, website. Correct, yeah. EmployShore.co.nz. Yep. Um, or you can just search EmployShore on Google and it'll come up. Fantastic. Hey, thank you for your time. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks.